You ever see, uh, listen to NPR, the, the, the two brothers who are the uh, car guys, and, and they always, yeah, click and clack, and they, they had one uh, comment about increasing your revenue, and how does a business increase their revenue with one six-letter word? You know, and, and so this is a shampoo company, and they want to sell more shampoo. So what do they do? They write instructions on the back of the bottle. You ever read it? It says, shampoo, rinse, repeat. repeat. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what this is. It's uh, well, actually shampoo's better because it actually does something. So, well, it is an honor to be here. Uh, I, I look forward to sharing you some of my uh, experience with uh, my MOC journey, I call it. It started six years ago after I took my first recertification board exam. I took uh, about a week off from work. Preceding that, I studied and then you know, had three small kids and I spent a lot of time in the office. And then would study and then took a week off, which is expensive when you have your own practice like I do. And so I was real nervous and worried about if I don't pass, of course, when you're an athlete, you don't think about what you may do wrong. You always think about the positive. So I, I got out of that exam and I just felt just uncomfortable. I, I felt like I was taken advantage of. And I just, the, 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 I couldn't put a word to it, but I didn't like it. And I just vowed, I'm not gonna do that again. And I told my wife and she kinda said, oh, well, whatever, you know, okay. But as I got on, I Googled, of course, and I, I met a lot of the people that are here today and, and learned a lot about uh, what I'm going to present to you. And uh, thank God for Google. I think that m makes a big, or the internet in general, makes a big difference from why we're here. Things go by fast. We can share a lot of information with one another, which I'd like to share this presentation. If you'd like the presentation, just email me. I put my email up there. Email me and I'll send you my presentation. There's some links that you may like. So, the learning objectives. Basically, uh, four, uh, the first being what uh, Charles talked about, the uh, ABMS. I'm gonna talk, I'm just gonna show you some slides about their overall uh, net revenues. I think you'll be uh, interested in that. The two, the, the, the attempt to push more MOC on us. Uh, in, in different ways, the creative ways. The uh, third is what we did here in Oklahoma uh, and contribute to, um, uh, well, uh, the, the third is, is the issue of MOC is to improve quality and, and uh, help protect the, the public from us physicians who are bad. And so I'll show you, at least in our numbers and in Oklahoma and Ohio numbers, that incompetence as measured by medical board actions against physicians is not very common. So, you know, what is MOC really doing? And then finally, our efforts here to pass uh, the, the anti-MOC legislation, the law that should come into, uh, come into law this November. So. I have no financial conflicts uh, in the content today. Uh, I am not a board director of uh, a board, uh, a, a national board of uh, psychiatry and neurology, which I, I belong to, and uh, and I pay, I had paid money to. Uh, but I do have other uh, disclosures that uh, when I went to my first meeting, CME meeting after residency, it was at this beautiful place, Big Cedar Lodge. Has anyone been to Big Cedar Lodge? Oh my gosh, fantastic, right? So I first meeting there and I met a fellow, this is the, the, the Southern Neurologic Society, I had a meeting there for years and years, and he made a comment as we are going throughout the, this is the conference center, and um, Bent Hook Marina, which I've been many times, Top of the Rock Golf Course, overlooking Table Rock Lake. This is in Missouri, southern Missouri, uh, uh, and adjacent to Arkansas. And this is a Civil War era cannon they shoot off to celebrate the end of each day. Uh, it is quite loud, but the cannon doesn't go very far, don't worry. Um, Truman Smokehouse, the Falls Lodge, 
And of course, the most important place for uh, our family is the Buzzard Bar. It's a restaurant and the singing cowboy. But when I was there, I was impressed by this, uh, this physician who said, when you, you're an attendee of a CME program, you, know, you look at the speaker and you, you assess their content and, and the data that they, they present and their, their impressions, and then you decide, uh, based on that individual and their experiences, what you believe in and, and what seems reasonable to you. And then I thought, well, that's really what you do and what we were trained to do every day, not just with patients, but we read journal articles or uh, consensus reports. We kind of try to assess where they got this data, how good it is, and how it pertains to us. And will it change our practices, improve our practice or not? So he presented himself, I like this, who he is, and I, I think that it, it, for the, today's talk, it's important to know that uh, I'm a private practice physician. I, I have my own practice. There's no one else there. I am all, therefore I'm an employer and a taxpayer. I've been married for nearly 30 years. I have three adult children. I'm a member of our board of the Tulsa County Medical Society. I'm a state medical association of Oklahoma member. I am not a member of the AMA. I am a member of AAPS. Yes. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of Ayn Rand. I, I, uh, Alice shrugged. Uh, actually, it was a required book for my economics class at Stanford. Wow. Like, yeah. I was like, wow. So uh, I read that, and I like, it has nothing to do with the class literally, but philosophically, it was fantastic. So I urge you, if you've never read that, to read it. Here's a quote that uh, she has in the book that basically we all ascribe to. We all want to do better in everything we do, right? We are, we are not takers, we're doers and producers. And that's pretty much what uh, we are so incensed about, about MOC, is it's forced upon us supposedly to make us better, but it doesn't, it just takes time. And I don't even argue about the money issue, and I think that's really a moot issue. Uh, the public looks at us, wealthy doctors, if we cry it costs a lot of money, we're not gonna get a lot of fans. But if we cry that it takes us away from being with you, then they kind of get it. And, and it does, and you know, I'll show you how it does that. So the ABMS, get on the website, and they espouse their the gold standard of quality. They serve the public. I didn't know that, but I guess they do. And they serve us. Wow, awesome. And so how do they do that? By improving quality of health care. I didn't know an organization can do that. I thought it was us. And you know, they set our professional standards. I don't think so. And then in partnership, with all these member boards. Well, first of all, I don't know if you have this information, Chuck, but I called a board of director at the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and I was interested, in, this is after I took my board exam, and I was really, I gotta get some information. And so I learned that they pay the ABMS $700,000 a year just to be a member. So that sounds like a franchisee, doesn't it? That's, that's what I think. Do you know about what other boards have to pay? I found that interesting. I couldn't find what other boards pay, but and that's a lot of money. Very interesting. And of course, there's no evidence that this MOC program does any good. So, you know, why are we doing this? Well, quality, everywhere I looked for the definition of quality, I did not see the word certified anywhere. In the words of Trump, ever, 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 never, never, never. I haven't seen it. So the, the ABMS, I'm not a, uh, an accountant, but I can add. And so what I did is I get online and I looked at all these form 990s, which they present online, and you can look up the net assets. And I just counted them up, all the ABMS and all the 24 subboards. And interestingly, as Chuck talked about, they own a lot of securities stocks and bonds, hopefully not bonds now, but lots of stock. And uh, it's interesting, they're, I don't ever say that they're, they're a non-profit group, because they're not. They make profit, but they are tax exempt. And that is something that we've talked a lot about, is sicking the, uh, the IRS on them, because this is just not right. This is not right that 
and it's not, some of it may be tax money, but it's our money being used for other, something other than what they say it's being used for. So I did the numbers. I can get numbers on GuideStar between 2013 and 2015. Most of the numbers were from 2013 and 2014, and I just added up the net assets, and I got two. And this is just with 16 boards. I didn't go all the way to 24 boards, and I got a lot of moolah. Okay, so that's half a billion dollars. Isn't that disgusting? Oh, I guess it isn't if you owned it, but uh, yeah, it is. It is disgusting if you if you earned it the way they earned it. It's it's not right. And uh, if you look at some of the websites there and some of the quote research they're doing, they're going outside. It's called the American Board of Medical Specialties, but they're going to places like the Philippines. You know what is that? It's not the American board, it's the world board. I think it's just a, a business decision, obviously. So uh, going to the, uh, the MOC underground, uh, which is something I discovered quite frighteningly, I learned that there's two programs that the Federation of State Medical Boards have pursued, apparently with ABMS in mind, to increase MOC. Uh, one is the maintenance of licensure. Well, this program really didn't go over very well. Uh, in Ohio, they beat it down. Here in Oklahoma, we, uh, it was a non-entity apparently. Uh, I spoke with our board uh, leaders here, the state board, and they would always say the same thing. Oh, no, we don't really know much about that. Uh, no, no, we have no plans for that. Nothing, but you know, underneath, the plan is to impose MOC on us through the licensure, and that would just be a bad thing. Partly because 20% of our nation's physicians are not certified. And I, I hate saying that word because it sounds like they're incomplete, and that's a different philosophical question, but they've trained, and like, like Andrew said, you, you know, I've, I have a college degree. I have never once had to go back to college and recertify, re-degree, right? I don't have to do high school, I don't have to do middle school, or, or in a kindergarten, I don't, you know, it's just, it's just preposterous. So, um, you know, this concept of MOL, uh, they didn't stop there. They, they hit a roadblock, but they um, got smart. They said, well, let's, let's do something different. So let's try the licensure compact. You've all heard about the, the Federation's licensure compact. So. There's a sh physician shortage, they recognize it. How can we help you? Oh, okay, well, we can make it easier to license across state lines, and, and that way you can work multiple places and there'll be less physician shortages. So one of our state representatives, a physician in 12 years, he just uh, recently left uh, from term limits, thought about this. He's a uh, ER physician. He always looking for new physicians to, to take spots, and, and he thought, this is great until McCulloch and I sat down with him, explained to him what it is. It's, it's just a way to get MOC forced upon all the physicians. And what would it do in general, and overall? It would decrease the number of physicians available because the 20% of physicians wouldn't be able to be licensed. I mean, it's just preposterous. So hopefully we can beat that uh, as well across uh, all states. Okay, so moving on. Incompetence. I don't like that word. It's too close to incontinence. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as a neurologist, I get a lot of calls from, about urology, and it's really odd. You know, hey, his, his tube fell out, of, and I'm like, out of his head? Oh, you want the urologist. Um, but uh, Dr. Kempen wrote a couple articles and presented data at Ohio, the medical board's actions against physicians, and the percent of people who are acted against for poor quality, very small, you can see 3%, I don't know if you can see that, um, a very small sliver. Uh, the, in Oklahoma, I took that article and I thought, okay, let's find out what Oklahoma is like. So I contacted our board and they wouldn't give me the data and I had to go to our executive director of our, our Tulsa County Medical Society and she got the data that afternoon. It's, it's kind of interesting. So I, I thumbed through 11 years of data. And it was, you know, I found it interesting. There's about 8,500 physicians in the state. I don't know how many of them are active physicians, but they're licensed. 
And each, any, in any year, there's only between 300 and 500 complaints. Of course, a lot of complaints are probably not valid, and they obviously aren't, because only about 10% of those complaints lead to an action. And the majority of those actions, as you would expect, are not related to quality. It's other stuff, you know, impaired physicians, um, from other states getting you know, information in the bootleg that, that they had problems elsewhere, financial dealings and, and other stuff. So, you know, this whole notion from ABMS that the quality is impaired and, and they need to protect the, the, the public from us is ridiculous. So that comes to the final uh, stage of my presentation, which is how do we level our playing field against these bad actors who are imposed, I mean, we, we are imposed upon all the time, regulations upon regulations, and this is imposed, MOC is imposed upon us, not from the government, but a, a private corporation that is not taxable, or they should be taxable, they're tax exempt. And these people are making, on average, I looked at all the board, uh, the, the tax returns show what these leaders make. These physicians are making typically between seven hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars a year in salary, and another two, three hundred thousand dollars in retirement. Well, that's a lot of money to work with no call and, and thirty-five hours a week, and they get they get uh, you know paid flights, first first uh, class flights uh, across the country. And that's all right, so how do we, how do, we've had endless discussions about how do we even up the playing field. And so, you know, this is, this is it. Just stop it, you guys. Stop recertifying, stop certifying. You can be a licensed physician without being certified. End of story, good night. Well, I wish that were the case, but it's not. Because we all know, in reality, you can't do that. And, and why is that? Because the hospitals, and I'm not going to say it's a conspiracy, I think what it is that the ABMS has a very good lobbying and, and they've marketed themselves as the board. But there's other boards out there. So how come those boards aren't also welcomed? And, and that's, you know, that's another question we need to, to pose. So we know people, I know people who chose not to recertify and now they're getting paid less from the state organization because they're on a different tier or the, the hospital decides to kick them off staff. And once you're off staff of a hospital and you're not on any hospital staffs, what happens? Insurance companies say, well, you can't be in network because you have to have a hospital to admit to. Well, I don't admit anybody. Well, still, that's our rule. So there's a lot of ridiculousness in our, in our profession. So how do we beat this? Well, we talked about an alternative pathway. And lo and behold, there is one. Now, so how many of you are, are aware of you know, the National Board of Physicians and Surgeons? Great. So there's some that, didn't, that wasn't aware. Get online. Look at it. It's very valid. Okay? And it's just more valid than MOC because it's not that expensive. It allows you to pursue your own lifelong learning, your own CME. Uh, the ABMS requires you, at least our board in psychiatry, I can't use my own CME where I want to go for my MOC. I have to use their sponsored CME. What's that about? Money. So here I just put on the, all the board members uh, at the National Board of Physicians and Surgeons, very impressive people. I've spoke to several of them. They're very earnest people. You apply if you're board certified now, regardless of the type of board, whether it's lifelong or, 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 uh, or a mock, you can for $169, and you give the right paperwork and your license, you can get recertified for two years. And I suggest you do that. The next plan, and you already heard about this, is to try to get your colleagues and, and on staffs everywhere to learn about this alternative and accept it on staff. We need competition, and that's what it, it uh, represents. This slide is to really appreciate all the people involved in this anti-MOC fight. It takes a lot of time, money. Dr. Ben Bissett uh, started this website that I learned about, the changeboardresearch.com. And so I learned about, I'm here today because of, of Ron. And you know, he does this all on his own. I mean, everyone involved spends a lot of time because we believe in it and we're making some headway. So you, you heard about uh, 
Kurt, excellent article. Read it if you can. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go to the next stage, which is how I got this law passed. I mean, I didn't write the law, but I, I started uh, with writing resolutions for our state medical association annual meetings, anti-MOC, and this is in 2012-2013, which many states were doing, and I heard other people doing, we shared language, and finally, in 2014, the AMA finally adopted their principles of MOC. Have you heard this? This, this is like, we thought this is awesome. We're like so excited, we're gonna walk around the halls of the hospital and they're gonna listen to us because the AMA, oh yeah, it's the AMA, I forgot. Um, they kind of listen to the AMA sometimes when they want to and they kind of don't when they don't want to. Uh, so it, it, it makes sense what, how it's written, but it really doesn't have any teeth, right? No, the hospitals don't listen to this. Insurance, they, they laugh at this. So I thought, what can we do to impose our will on them rather than vice versa? So I have to show you this video because this, this, if I can, it's Indiana Jones as the physician group fighting the MOC bad guy. Are, are the people in the back were jumping for joy. <laughs> so I actually was thinking about how do we stop these people in their tracks and um, I thought, gosh, hey, they impose it on us, why don't we impose it on them? And let's go to our state legislators. So at our, I wanted support from the physicians. I didn't want to go personally to legislators. I wanted it to be a group Effort. So I went to our state, you know, annual medical uh, meeting with our state, with Oklahoma State Medical Association, and presented this idea. And it was 100% yays. Of course, and the nays probably didn't say anything; they were scared. So we handed it off to our our legislative liaison, Wes Glinsman. He handed it off to two people, in, one in the Senate who is a, uh, a an attorney was very friendly to physicians, uh, Brian Crane, and then uh, Dr. Ritz, who is in the state, uh, in the House. And they got together and they wrote up this law, which is basically the AMA principles of MOC in law form. And you know, we, it, went, it passed so fast that when they called me, said it was passed, I didn't even know what they were talking about. I was like, wait, what? And I was getting emails from people going, hey, good job. I'm like, about what? And then I couldn't believe how fast it went. And of course, you know, that is, you know, what, what remains to be seen is how it is taken by hospitals and us. If we take this law in our hand and go to our staff meetings and demand that this be uh, a, a template, we will get somewhere. And, and really what we're asking for is competition, National Board of Physicians and Surgeons being an alternative and other boards, not just that, other boards being uh, an option for us and have an option to use an alternative to certification. And in my belief, I think that certification means well, but the reality is, is when you buy a car and you drive off that lot, why would I have to go somewhere else to put a video game in there and, and speakers? And, I mean, that's ridiculous. When I leave that lot, I want everything intact. And so when I finish my training, I want to be completely trained, right? Well, you take these board, the annual board exams as a resident to see how you're doing, right? Hey, great idea, for 100 bucks, why don't we just have your board exam, part of your fellowship and residency, when you walk out that door and you, you graduate, that's it. Whether you wanna take a recertification exam should be your, your desire if that's your CMA program or not. Some people love to take tests, I don't. I really like to learn as I'm doing. So I think there are some options, but in today's world, right now, we do have a challenge, and that is 
if you have a mass uh, you know, uh, refusal to, to recertify, you're going to have problems with your practice. And, and, and if you're an employed physician, employers will say sorry. Unless that employer thinks that they're going to save a lot of money, which they would, by also being anti-MOC. And I have not, we haven't gotten to that level of bringing in these big employers and showing them how much less time physicians will be gone. I mean, they, they, and how much time and money they're spending on an MOC. So uh, I think the, the legislative um, efforts are being duplicated elsewhere. I think they're making headway. I think it's too difficult for the ABMS to fight 50 different states. It, it, would, it would cost them a lot. They have the money. I mean, they, they do have the money. So don't, be, don't, don't think, and I, I thought originally, boy, we're going to really kick butt, but the reality is, is they, if you're making that kind of money, are you going to just say, oh, gosh, the doctors are together, I'm, I'm just going to go away. Uh-uh. I mean, you, if you're making a million dollars a year doing not very much work, it's kind of hard to leave, and they're going to fight tooth and nail. So thank you for your time.